sorry. Yeah, okay, so welcome and good evening. So I've got a friend here who is based in Japan, but interesting thing is he's American and his name is Edmundo Luna and he's an expert in Balinese language and culture among many other things. He's a polyglot and a performer and a very, 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 uh, I would say he's a, he's a very talented linguist. So Edmundo, please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do and yeah, so you can start. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Brian. So um, my name is Edmundo Luna and um, basically I've specialized in Balinese and um, Indonesian for the past, I would say like 20 years or something like that. So to bring us back to when I first started getting interested in Balinese, uh, we have to go back to my life as a performer. So in a former life, and uh, so for a very long time, I would say, uh, let's say over 30 years now, goodness. So over for wow. over 30 years now, uh, I've been an, uh, uh, let's say an avid performer of uh, Balinese gamelan and dance. And uh, how I got started with that? Well, uh, I come from a Filipino background. So it, it's sort of like a kinship uh, sort of like, you know, you you sort of like gravitate towards uh, certain things that sort of like, they're not the same, but they resonate with you. So I, I had a little bit right. of that happening to me when I was in the third grade. Okay. Uh, so this is, yeah, so back in the third grade in elementary school, uh, there was this graduate student from one of the local universities. So he came on over and I believe he was from uh, the music department. Uh, so he was an ethnomusicologist, and so he brought over one of his uh, Balinese colleagues, and they had like a whole sort of like performance for us, for us third graders. And I just thought to myself, like after that presentation, I thought to myself, man, I have to learn this someday. And, um, you know, whether it be, let's say, in university, like uh, he was doing at the time, or, you know, perhaps even sooner, uh, I had really no idea when that was going to happen, but um, a few years later, so one of my teachers noticed my interests in Indonesian performing arts, and she said, well, uh, we have a local program uh, at the local university that you can attend. You might be the youngest person there, uh, but uh, I've got the contact information for the person that you can contact if you want to, uh, if you're interested in joining. And so she gave me uh, this person's in information, and uh, this was uh, the information for the late Dr. Robert E. Brown, who I believe uh, first coined the term world music. So he was he was a um, well, Professor Emeritus uh, over at San Diego State University and um, under his charge, um, he had uh, one teacher who taught both Balinese and Javanese uh, gamelan. Uh, and uh, this is like the same Balinese instructor. Uh, this same Balinese instructor is has been teaching in Colorado for I would say the past 30, uh, 30 odd years. Um, but he was my first teacher of Balinese Gamelan, and he also taught me dance, and he uh, sort of introduced me to this whole world of Balinese performing arts. And uh, from that, uh, I became a linguistics major when I was at, at university, and I wanted to pursue studying uh, about uh, Balinese language, um, you know, soon after. So that's how I got interested in Balinese language. That's a very interesting story, and it, uh, yeah, it's interesting that you ended up. Uh, I, I, were you ever in Indonesia or in Bali itself, or, or if you did, how long? Were you yes, there? yes, yes. So um, I did my doctoral work uh, on Balinese language, and uh, I spent a few months uh, gathering data. So about three, uh, I would say, like three or four months, uh, just like. Uh, during a summer and uh, let's say a larger part of the fall semester, fall quarter. And so I got all the data that I needed for my dissertation, took it home, 
uh, went through uh, the, the data. So I had like two like huge recordings of, um, well, uh, this village assembly material in, in Balinese. So not only was it uh, like spoken Balinese, spoken by all of these uh, like different people, but it was refined. It was like middle level Balinese. So I needed to be able to um, interpret that like uh, correctly and accurately. So that, that was like a, a huge learning curve. Uh, but yeah, it, it's just because um, you don't really, I, I mean, you use like middle level Balinese uh, with strangers and with right. large assemblies. Right. And that's it. Like everyone else, you either like shift higher if you're speaking to, let's say, a high priest right. versus like you're speaking to a fellow kins uh, person, right. then you have to sort of uh, shift your levels quite a bit. So it's a bit like uh, the Japanese keigo or the yeah. uh, Korean chundenma uh, sort of model there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Maybe it's not as complex. Uh, I, I'd have to say like the Javanese system is a lot more complex yeah. than the uh, Balinese yeah. system. Yeah. So, so as just, far just as to, I understand. So just to interrupt, could you could you a bit explain like to, to people who are watching who don't know about Balinese or Javanese language uh, in general, could oh. you explain like the, the speech levels and yeah, roughly what they are and yeah. Okay, and how okay. How they are used. So uh, for both Balinese and Javanese, um, and uh, this is the sort of thing that didn't come, uh, it, it didn't come into vogue until let's say you had the major sort of, uh, um, I would say like dynasties or like the, the major palaces like emerge onto the scene. So the, uh, a lot of these levels are only about uh, a few centuries year old, uh, years old, basically. Uh, but for both Balinese and Javanese, um, so uh, it's it's a multi-layered uh, sort of um, uh, lexical uh, strata. So uh, it's no wonder that people often say that if you learn uh, either Balinese or Javanese, it's like learning two or three different languages at once because you have like this extended range of very different vocabulary right. items. Um, and uh, you have to keep in mind, uh, first of all, who you're talking to and then, ver and then also who you're talking about. Uh, so I think most of, let's say the Japanese version or the Korean version, uh, you know, uh, Japanese keigo and uh, let's say Korean chundenmal, uh, so the uh, for Japanese keigo, a lot of it has to do with how uh, verbs are right. conjugated. Right. So verb uh, conjugation, and that also goes for uh, Korean chundenmal, like how how verbs are conjugated. Whereas with both Balinese and Javanese, it goes not only to verbs like different verbs, but uh, different pronouns, right. Uh, right. even different prepositions, mm -hmm. different prepositions and sometimes different numbers okay. as well. Interesting. So it's it's highly pervasive yeah. and it's not, and it, it's, it's often like sort of substituting one form for the other, for another uh, when you're talking uh, with somebody else, but you have to keep in mind like, uh, and then uh, that relationship could also change so the uh, other person may want, you know, they, they may say something like, well, I think I would be, I would feel better with this form. So uh, that often happens. Uh, so like one of the most, um, yeah. let's say sensitive uh, terms is, are the verbs to eat in Balinese. Okay. So there, yeah. So there is like najan, that is sort of like the the uh, sort of default one. So najan madar or nar is a little bit lower, but still rather respectful. So there's uh, uh, najan madar. Uh, there is marayunan, uh, which refers to a high priest seating. So this mm -hmm. is like extremely honorific. 
And uh, there are some sort of debased forms as well uh, to eat. So if you want to get into a fight with someone, uh, you can describe their, um, their eating as ngamah. So ngamah is really debased. It's really right. low. It's, it's really crass. So it's sort of like uh, kue in Japanese mm -hmm. or ku in Japanese. But I, you know, um, I, I'm not sure whether, uh, I guess most people who sort of feel, they, they may feel insulted if they were, if their eating were described with like kue. Mm -hmm. uh, however, with ngama, like if you want to really get into a fight with someone, like use that term to describe their eating uh, because it's even lower than nida, which refers oh. to animals eating. Right. So nida refers to animals eating. That's like sort of like uh, you would use that for animals only. Uh, and people consider it even lower than that. Right. So interesting. Yeah. And there are like, uh, like apart from those five, uh, five or six that I've already told you about, there are like five other terms and they're pretty debased as well. They, they refer to other types of uh, animals eating. Okay, that is interesting. Yeah. Cool. Okay, so that's, that's the Balinese uh, language in, in general. So um, in general, in yeah. general, yeah, of course, very interesting. Uh, it, it, is it very close to Javanese, for example, either any other uh, level? Or... Uh, well, they've um, there there are lots of uh, terms that they share in common. Uh, that mm -hmm. uh, there are lots of uh, Javanese loans in Balinese, okay. and probably like vice versa. Mm -hmm. I'm not I'm not so certain about that, but. Uh, According to Adelar, so according to, I believe mm -hmm. it's like Adelar 2005. Okay. So Balinese belongs in the same sub branch as Malay, as um, let's say, and, and the uh, languages of uh, Sumbawa. Uh, so mm -hmm. they, they call this like the Malayo Sumbawan right. uh, sub branch, which includes, I believe, like Sundanese, mm -hmm. um, Madurese, I think think, okay, yeah. uh, Balinese, Sasak, and then uh, one or two of the languages on Sumbawa and uh, Malay. Uh, and then Javanese exists as its own sub-branch. Yeah. So it's completely separate, Got it. wow. even though they've, uh, they've uh, sort of borrowed uh, from each other quite extensively, mm -hmm. but they are considered like uh, on separate sub-branches. That, that is interesting. Uh, to know this yeah. like relationship and all that. So, so I, I imagine there's very little like if a Javanese person speaks Javanese and a Balinese person speaks Balinese, they probably it wouldn't be 100% intelligible to each other, I guess. Probably not, probably not. Especially if they started speaking uh, sort of like the, uh, let's say the low level Ngoko right. versus the mm -hmm. low level, let's say uh, Basa Kasar yeah. uh, or Basa Biasa yeah. in Balinese. They, they would not be able to understand each other. Right, that's, just, that's very interesting. I always notice that when Balinese people speak, they often end in the, 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 the words, uh, <laughs> kind of uh, like a, a way, uh, uh, a lot of Malaysian people speak that way, uh, Malay, Malay, Malaysian, Malay, also Matran, Malay people as well. Like, uh, yeah, you hear that a lot yeah. In Bali, not in Javanese, but in Balinese, you, you hear that very clearly. Well, uh, in Javanese, at least in central Javanese, it's a little bit different. So it's yeah. awe mm -hmm. and it's, it spreads. So yes. there's a little, uh, like, it, it, there's like a highly uh, applicable uh, or applicable sort of like a spreading, uh, awe, uh, let's say awe spreading, mm -hmm. like from uh, the right edge. And then it depends oh, on mm -hmm. the structure of the uh, previous feet. Right. You know, are they like, um, if they are closed syllables, then you won't have that spread. But if they're open, then it will spread, uh, you know, to the beginning of the word. Right. And that does not happen in Balinese. In Balinese, mm -hmm. it's just a, a final ah that becomes a. Uh. That's interesting. And, uh, and even that sound has a lot of variation mm -hmm. within the island itself because okay. I, I speak with an uh, um, but there are plenty of people, like plenty of my friends who uh, come from, let's say, Tabaran Regency, who uh, pronounce that vowel more with an aw, 
So it's okay. more like oh. an open O. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of like variation. Okay. And uh, people will comment on that variation as well. Right. They, and they, they can often pinpoint like, oh, you're from this area or like you're, you're from this part of the island. That's interesting. Yeah, it's a Bali is a small island, so it's quite interesting. There's so much variation within a, a small area, relatively. Quite, That's quite. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And um, uh, it, it's oh, sorry. No, 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 uh, and fine. it's it, it's an island with um, a lot of uh, well natural barriers. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have like a, a central ridge of mountains, like right. in the middle. So that that sort of uh, plays a role in uh, really trying to distinguish uh, different areas of, uh, of Balinese where it's being spoken and really cements like uh, those differences, those regional differences really until very recently. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, so um, now that you've given a very interesting overview about Bali and Balinese in general, uh, we can talk about mm -hmm. the one characteristic which is the numeral system because the counting system is quite different from Malay or other Austronesian languages, except maybe Javanese, we talk about some similarities, but this, the, the, the numeral system is very uh, interesting. Could you give an explanation about that? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm i going to share my screen yes, here. Please. Okay. I, I have uh, prepared a little presentation of this, you know, in, uh, in preparation for our little meeting here. Thank you. So let please, me just do this. Just... Okay. All right, I'm just going to change the view to speak of you and yeah, so okay. you should be able to turn on. Yep, I see it coming. All right, so you see that? Yes. Okay. Beautiful. So uh, basically, I'm, yeah, so I guess uh, what I'm going to be talking, uh, you know, mostly at this point is the uh, inner workings of the Balinese numeral system, because it is... I, I would say for a lot of learners of Balinese, this is one of the most frustrating things about the language itself. Just trying to negotiate the, the numeral system, the, yeah. the numbers. So uh, the first things that I'd like to say here is that uh, these aren't my own uh, observations. So a lot of these are based off uh, off of the writings of Eisman, Fred B. Eisman, who, uh, well, he passed away a few years ago now, um, but he was a longtime resident on the island and basically one of the, I would say like one of the uh, most astute cultural observers. Uh, of, and uh, after all this time, after all these years he spent on the island, he uh, became like a fluent speaker of Balinese. And uh, there, I believe in one of his uh, volumes of Sakala Niskala. So there is the um, reference for that. So Fred B. Eisman, uh, 1990, uh, Sakala Niskala on, uh, in his volume two of that series, he talks about the Balinese language in particular. And uh, there is a, a really nice section on Balinese numerals and how a lot of the, these numerals came about. Okay. Okay, yeah. So as uh, I said earlier, yeah, so as I said earlier about Balinese, so it's an Austronesian language off of the Malayo Sumbawan subbranch. So this is uh, uh, based off of uh, Adelar's work. And to tell you the truth, it's not like a uh, vintage sedimental, like it's not like French, it's not like old French or anything like that. It's not Mayan. It's basically a decimal system. Mm -hmm. But what makes it so frustrating is that <laughs> there are several suppletive yeah. items uh, yeah. from various uh, sources. So you have this sort of like decimal system. You think, okay, decimal system, I, I can handle that. You know, that's like most languages of this world. Uh, but when you have uh, like a lot of these items being substituted with uh, these uh, like out of the blue uh, sort of entries, then you sort of wonder like, where do these come from and yeah. why? Yeah. So uh, what Eisman has to say is that a lot of these terms uh, are derived from particular combinations of uh, what are called kepeng or pisbolong, which are Chinese cash coins. 
Uh, and uh, these were used like extensively for trade before. Now they're only used, let's say, in rituals. So for offerings and things like that. Um, uh, and uh, let's say uh, religious uh, sort of artifacts. So this is where you see them now, and they are important for that in certain sums. Um, but even before that, um, like we were dealing with, let's say, threads and threads of pisbolong, of uh, kepeng. And so you could not really get away with just spending a few kepeng. So um, uh, although there is like a denomination of akateng, which means like one of these coins, and um, but that was quite rare. You needed like a lot more kepeng to in order to do pretty much anything, uh, you know, with uh, trade. And uh, just to uh, let you know, th so this is pispolong uh, or kepeng in the um, context of of a religious offering. In this case, I believe it's what's called a kwangen. So this is a kwangen, which uh, a lot of people like have as a part of their chanang. They're, they're sort of like a little offering tray. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe uh, the way that this is um, positioned and the way that this is formed, um, at some point, uh, the person, if they choose to do so, they can, um, at least for the gentlemen and for the ladies as well, they can put it in their hair. Uh, with the fan portion like facing backwards. Okay. So this is what, yeah. So this is this is what we call um, a. Uh, well, uh, this is what we call a kwangen. And um, why is this important for a pispolong? Well, in order to make the kwangen or similar offerings effective, like ritually effective, they need what is called an urip which is like a life force a life. and this, yeah. So a, a life force and uh, the life force in this case takes, uh, uh, takes place in the form of a kepe uh, of one of these coins. So that's why you see like coins all over the place. And that's why a lot of these offerings incorporate uh, these hold coins, these uh, Chinese cash coins. They are so ritually um, important, yeah. Wow. Okay. Now, uh, let's, sorry, uh, okay. So for the Balinese numerals, um, so there is the presence, uh, as I said before, uh, there are some numerals where you have like the low version versus like the high version. This is only true from one to three, and then everything else is pretty much the same. Uh, so uh, it, the low forms uh, from uh, one to ten are the following: so sa uh, or bise, dua, tulu, pat, lima, nam, pitu, kutus, siel, dasel, and of course dasel comes from Sanskrit. Uh, and then uh, from one, uh, let's say from one to ten uh, in the high form. Well, the only mm -hmm. uh, different. Uh, numerals are from one to three. So asiki, yep. kale, tiga, and then pa, lima, nam, pitu, kutosyo, dasel. And uh, there are a couple of things that um, I could uh, comment. Yep. Uh, and I, I, I do believe like uh, some of your viewers, when you're talking about uh, numerals, like why, why uh, in Philippine languages, why do we have like walo, and reflexes of walu, and then why dilapan mm -hmm. in uh, you know like uh, varieties of Malay and uh, like neighboring languages uh, like, and I do believe like with Balinese, there's something similar going on here, and uh, a lot of this has to do with like the former uh, version or the uh, ancestral form of eight, which is ulu, mm -hmm. and that. Of course, that refers. That also refers to the head of something. Uh -huh. Right, 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 right. Yeah. So, so, so it's, it's, one's uh, head. Okay. So there, yeah. there is a bit of a taboo going on mm -hmm. there. 
And, uh, but you still see this, this ulu form in the uh, suffixed form uh, or the multiple form for eight. So if you're saying like 80, then you would say ulung dasal. Okay. So right. it exists for that, but only that. Right. Um, otherwise, we have this form kutus. And um, where kutus comes from, okay, uh, you might think this is going to come from left field. Uh, but I recent, I came upon this sort of definition for kutus, let's say, in Tagalog. Um, and it's basically the wrapping of one's knuckles on oh. a hard surface. Right. So wrapping. you have like eight, eight knuckles wrapping on a hard right, surface, right. like exactly. with both hands. Exactly. I'm so. not. I, I. I'm not sure how to check for this though. That, <laughs> that's know. my only problem uh, with this. But that gave me sort of like an idea. I don't know where to take it though. So yeah, that that's yeah. my. That's my current thought uh, on the origins of kutus. And um, like if it ever did exist in Balinese as like wrapping one's knuckles on a hard surface, on a flat surface, um, that evidence is now gone because of course, uh, nowadays people just say kutus for eight. Uh, but that's, that's one of the theories that I have uh, for this particular uh, form. Yeah. I'm not sure how that sounds, but. Oh, it, it sounds interesting, no, no, but, it, but given the general pattern of how like sometimes word taboos of, you know, can, can make you switch vocabulary for numbers and stuff like this, is, it, it might be. It, right. very, very plausible to me, it's interesting. <laughs> okay, right. So. so that's my little pet, uh, pet theory there. Oh, thank you, um, that's interesting, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Okay, so another thing that I have to tell you about Balinese numerals is that uh, they also have uh, what are called reduplicated numerals. So this involves like a partial reduplication of the first CV or the CVC syllable. And this is used to refer to uh, ind like independent items or sets of independent items or, or groups. So what do I mean uh, by this? So if I were to say like the two of them, then I could say ajat da dua. So dua of course is two, but in order to refer to let's say two of them, you would have to use the reduplicated form. So da dua. And uh, to say like the two of them together, you would use the uh, verb of accompaniment here, which is aja, and then ajat da dua means like the two of them there or the two of them together. And uh, there is another set of numerals here, uh, which are the nasalized forms. So this is with the nasal suffix n. And uh, these are used with uh, measurements and classifiers. So much like sort of like the ligatured forms in Tagalog. So uh, quite some commonalities there with uh, other languages that I'm uh, familiar with. So uh, we, to say like, let's say three kilograms, you cannot say tulu kilogram. It just does not make sense. So you have to say tulung kilogram. So three kilograms, and this is uh, a measurement. And uh, Balinese has its own uh, set of classifiers as well. Mm -hmm. And you would also use uh, nasalized numerals with those. Okay, so what do these uh, reduplicated and nasalized forms look like? Uh, there are no reduplicated forms for uh, one. Uh, you just use sort of like the uh, regular number for one, that's it. Uh, the nasalized form uh, basically is an a, uh, so it's an a uh prefix. So to say like one kilo, you would say a kilo uh, and uh, things like that. Uh, and then uh, for two, the reduplicated form is dadua or kakale for the higher forms. And then the nasalized form is duang. 
and I don't think there is a nasalized uh, high form uh, for two. I think it's just duang. Um, and then for three, we have tetlu or tetiga uh, for the higher form. And then the nasalized forms are either telung or tigan. Uh, and if you notice like um, dadwa and tetlu, it sort of it, it sort of sounds like the regular numerals for Tagalog. And exactly. I think, mm -hmm. yeah, and I think like Tagalog, like before, before those became the default numerals, I think they had like a distinction between mm. like reduplicated numerals and just sort of like the um, the regular, let's say, Austronesian uh, yeah. numerals, sort of like uh, Saad, uh, Isad, uh, Dua, Talo. Mm. Uh, yeah. And uh, so there, they might have had that distinction before and now it's just completely taken over the reduplicated forms have completely taken over uh the um first three numbers uh let's see uh for four we have papat or pat pat uh depending on who you talk to uh and then the nasalized form is patang and then uh five we have lima uh for the reduplicated form and then limang for the nasalized forms. And then um, six, we have num num, num num uh, for the, re the reduplicated forms and then a num for nasalized form. And then um, for seven, we have pupitu. And then uh, the nasalized form is uh, pitong. And then eight, nine, and 10, we don't really have a reduplicated form. They have the uh, prefix uh in front. So we have akutos asio adaso uh, for eight, nine, and 10 for uh, the reduplicated um, forms. Uh, and as I said before, um, let's say uh, for eight, the only place where we have a nasalized form is before uh, multiples of eight. So ulung, so like uh, ulung dasel, meaning 80. Uh, and uh, there are no, as far as I believe, there are no uh, nasalized forms for either nine or 10. So those are the other two uh, Balinese numeral forms, uh, like uh, from one to 10. And then uh, in the teens, so you count this way, and for both high and low Balinese, so it's solas, roras, tlulas, patblas, limolas, numblas, pitulas, palakutos, siangolas, duangdaso. And you can sort of see here, like kutos, yep. like for the number eight, it entered later into the system. Mm -hmm. uh, just because of the pala rather than blas. Yes. Uh, you would sort of expect like some sort of blas, but no, it's pala kutos. So I think it's like, uh, like pulo kutos. I believe that's what Eisman has said. Okay. So it's like 10 plus eight, mm -hmm. but it had to have entered the system later. All right, uh, so going on. Uh, so the numerals in the 20s, these are all suffixed by likur. Mm. Oh, okay, yeah. Which, um, I mean, so likur means like on the back of, mm -hmm. and uh, on the back of what? On the back of 20, uh, as um, Eisman puts it. So this, uh, of course, this form is uh, cognate with um, Tagalog likot which is like the physical back. Yeah. And I do believe uh, you find these forms in Javanese as well. So you have for 21, you have salikur, uh, 22 is dualikur, uh, 23 is tululikur, um, and then 24 is patlikur. Now, what about for 25? Okay, this is where uh, we have the first of our suppletive numeral forms. So 25 is the first culprit. So the uh, word for 25 is selae. So selae, uh -huh. selae comes from 
uh, the words, so like the sa uh, prefix meaning one, and then lawe meaning a th one thread of 25 keping coins. Whoa. One thread of 25 uh, pispolong. So that's where our first suppletive form comes in. Interesting. And yeah, so this is the first of these right. Chinese cash coin forms. And uh, these are going to be significant because they will make their uh, they will make inroads mm -hmm. to a lot of these numerals. Okay. okay yeah. Going on. Okay, so we go up to let's say thirty, uh, which is tulung daso. Mm -hmm. So uh, okay, fine. That's like three tens tulung daso, and then you. Uh, Tulung daso besi, tulung daso dua, so 31, 32, you go on until you hit 35. Mm -hmm. uh, this one is quite special uh, because uh, this isn't necessarily a uh, ca Chinese cash coin yeah. form, but it's sort of like a, so, uh, it's a creative use of uh, mathematics here. So uh, the and I'm not sure like how many younger uh, speakers use this particular form now. I'm not sure if they even know it, but this is like the original form for 35, which is pasasur. Uh, so pasasur comes from pat, which means four, and then sasur means to cleave a group of 10 and half, meaning five. So you have four, four groups of 10, and then you cleave, you split one of them in half uh, with five remaining. So you have 35. That's interesting. Is, is, yeah. is, there a, is there a reason why they would want to replace 35 with Pasasur other than, you know, Talung Dasa, you know? Talung uh, Dasa Lima. Talung yeah. Dasa Lima. I think that's what a lot of younger speakers okay. say these days. Yeah, so they, uh, I think a lot of younger speakers are, are regularizing it. Okay, okay. It's very interesting. It reminds me a bit of Danish numbers, they, the way they do that as well, like fractions of something, something to get 50 years. Like I remember something. Right. They do something similar right. with it, cleaver right. of, of, of tens or fives or something. Yeah. Right. It's interesting. Okay. You don't get it in other um, numerals that end in five, though. Okay. You, you don't really. This is the mm -hmm. only place where this happens. Uh, Wow. For some odd reason. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So four groups of 10, then cleave one group in half. Yeah. Okay. You get 35. Pasasur. Uh, 45. Okay. So 45. This is another one of our ca uh, Chinese cash coin um, terms, but for a, a slightly different reason. So uh, 45 is sitiman, which comes from one se plus timahan, which means oh. a piece of foil with opium. Okay. Yeah. So it's a sitiman. Interesting. And so back in the day, so what timahan of opium used to cost 45 kepeng. Uh, so it is a Chinese cash coin yeah, term, yeah, yeah. just sort of indirectly. Interesting. And, and Tima is also the word for tin in, in Malay as well. Uh, uh, tin, yes, tin yes. Course. So Tima, right. Tima Han, okay. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, going on. Okay, so 45, then we get up to 50. This is where we get another regular um, sort of uh, Chinese cash coin term. So uh, the word for 50 is Sekat. And this comes from sa plus ikat, which is a tie of two threads, lawe of 25 cash coins, which equals 50. So sekat. Are you confused yet? Maybe, you know, I'm okay for now. I, I've seen this before, so I'll just, it's good to know where they come from as I've been scratching my head over the origins of uh, the different okay. forms. Uh, like, 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 you know, yeah. Like 50, like sick of right. 50, where they come from, and also this is, this is very right. interesting. Yeah. 
Now, uh, the <laughs> word for Sorry. 60, the, the word for 60, this is where um, Balinese diverges. It, it, it's quite regular uh, compared to the Javanese system. So uh, for 60, um, this is called, this is Numdasa in Balinese, which is just six tens, but Sawida in Javanese. And I'm not exactly sure, no one's been, a, no one's been able to uh, answer this, like why, like yeah. Sawida, like what does Wida re refer to? And since it doesn't, it, you know, you can't find it in Balinese. Um, mm -hmm. This is something that uh, Eisman does not really address. Right. Yeah, so yeah. as I, as far as I know, its origins are unknown, but, and uh, Javanese speakers, I still believe, you know, I, I believe they still uh, use uh, Sabuida uh, to stand for 60. Okay, our next uh, suppletive numeral up is 75. Okay, you can sort of imagine, okay, we, we have, we had one at 25, we had another at 50. So 75 is probably the next uh, spot. So what would you say would be the appropriate form for uh, 75? It maybe, I don't know, three threads or, or, or something like that. It, yeah, so exactly. So it's Tulum Benang. Tulum Benang. So it's three threads. <laughs> That's interesting. Oh, Benang, okay, now they say Benang. Benang, not, uh, so na ikat, na lawe. Yeah. You would think like Tulum Lawe, but no, they use Benang. So yeah. Tulum Benang, which means three, uh, which is the nasalized form. So Tulum plus Benang, which is uh, still this thread of 25. And that equals 75. Oh, okay. And I, 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 I believe this form is still extensively used. And then the next one up, so uh, 100 is Satos. That is what we would expect. Right. Uh, but the next one up is, um, uh, apart from, let's say, uh, Satos Lai, which is 125, right. you know, uh, things like that. Now, um, the next suppletive numeral is 150. Um, and 150 oh. uh, is actually Krobla. So it comes yeah. from Kro, which refers to 200. So 200, and then Bla means to split one of those uh, groupings of 100 in half. So you have two, and then split one in half, you get 150, so Uh The next one up is one, uh, 175. And uh, the, uh, the form for this is Lebat. And now the origins of this is rather unclear, even to Eisman. So he, even he did not know, like during his lifetime, uh, where Lebat came from. So people just know it as Lebat. Mm -hmm. Now, do people want to regularize this and say, mm -hmm. let's say, Satos Tlung Banan? That's also an option. I'm not sure like how widespread that is. Uh, although I, I do believe that some people would say it that way. Okay, so going on, the next yeah. one up is 200. And this is basically, uh, I would say it's one of the huge uh, sums of uh, Chinese cash uh, oh. coin uh, <laughs> strings. So this comes uh, from oh. Sata. So we have sa, uh, of course, we have sa meaning one, and then ata, which means a bundle of 200 kipping. <laughs> so one bundle, one bundle of 200. So sata. Okay. Okay. Uh, the next one up is 400, which I believe you know. So it's 
uh, Samas. Mm -hmm. Ah, okay. So right, Samas, right. yeah. So Samas comes from one, and then Mas, which is a gold coin worth four hundred kepeng. Okay. So that's uh, Samas. And then going up, all right, so we have Satak for 200, Samas for 400, and then for 600, 600 is Tlungata, okay. which is three times three times 200, which is, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so Tlung, uh, so 600. Going up further, 800. Mm -hmm. So if you remember, uh, 400 is Samas. Mm -hmm. So 800 is Domas, Doma. which means okay. so two, like Dua. Yes. So Do and then Mas, this coin worth 400 keping. And then 1200, 1200 mm -hmm. is uh, quite a special one. Okay. Uh, so what 1000 is uh, Siu, this is what we okay. would expect. Yeah. Like, uh, so it's, it's very Austronesian. Yeah. 1200, uh, this uh, also goes back to uh, this bundle of Atta, uh, but it doesn't use uh, the word Atta. Instead, it uses a special form, uh, Bangsit, so Nam Bangsit. Ooh. So 1200, so num meaning six, and then bangsik, uh, which is the same thing as ata, but they do they never say namata. They always say num bangsik, okay. meaning 1200. And then going on further, 1400 is uh, pitung bangsik. Okay. So seven of these bangsik. And then I think I'm getting to the end of my suppleta forms here. Okay. <laughs> okay. So 1600. Uh, so this is what we call sapa. Oh. So 1600. <laughs> so sapa, it, it, it probably is from sa, which means one, and then pa, pa, which means thigh. And okay. why like one thigh? Perhaps like eight. Uh -oh. uh, Eight of these atta bundles uh, approximated the girth or the thickness of a typical adult thigh. Right. This this cool. is what um, some people have uh, uh, they theorize this. Um, we're not exactly sure, but we know that it comes from like one thigh. Sapa. Mm -hmm. And uh, just about the other forms, so I, I did say this before, like siu comes from sa plus iwu, or iwu meaning a thousand. Um, however, if you go like 2000 mm -hmm. and further on, you no longer use iwu. So <laughs> wow. iwu, iwu is only valid for one, 1000. Okay. But to count in multiples of a thousand, you would use tali which okay. is a, a rope of 1,000 kepeng. So duang tali, uh, uh, telung tali, and then uh, so on and so forth. Okay. And uh, like beyond that, I believe, let's say you have like akati uh, or koti, which is, uh, or uh, what is it like, lax? Oh, you have yeah. like laksa, which is 10,000 10, akoti, which is like a hundred thousand, exactly. even though people don't really use yeah. that. And then uh, one million, which is ayuta. Mm -hmm. um, and then that's basically it for our uh, suppletive numeral uh, Balinese numerals here. Okay, it's interesting. And uh, yeah. just some Balinese numeral fun. <laughs> yes. Okay. They're, they're, yes. Uh, so. Balinese is a language filled with puns and uh, language play. And uh, one of my favorite expressions uh, do, does involve numerals. Um, so uh, if you want to, you might say about someone, 
so yum satakwang salai, which means that he or she is 200 minus 25. Oh, okay. Kuang is so, kurang, eh? less than it. Yeah, so kuang uh, is kurang. In Tagalog kulang, kurang. Yeah, kulang, yeah. So uh, he or she is two, 200 minus 25. So if you do the if you do the equation, what would that equal? 175. 175. So what is our Balinese form for 175? Oh, what was that one? Okay. <laughs> I can't remember that one. Yeah. It, it's yeah. <laughs> Lebak. So one hundred seventy-five is Lebak. Lebak. And yes. what this and Lebak sounds like Sebak, oh, which okay. means having one's mouth open. <laughs> and basically, if you say that he or she is two hundred minus twenty-five, you're basically saying he or she is crying. Oh, okay. <laughs> interesting yeah because of this uh sort of word play but you have to sort of work back mm -hmm. this is like the uh the fun that you can have with uh balinese and yes, balinese yes. expressions wow. and this is like a this is a well-known expression so if you at you know if you ask any balinese speakers do you know this they'll say oh yeah uh, and uh they will probably say oh it's quite old like people have been using this forever. And uh, oh, yes. yeah, so uh, here are some of the references that I've used, uh, you know, mm -hmm. in, in my talk today. And um, let me go on yeah. to uh, just sort of like extra projects, like what I'm also involved with. Yes. Uh, besides yes. like research uh, mm -hmm. on Balinese and uh, Indonesian. So uh, some of the other things I've been involved in. So I've been involved uh, for a number of years now uh, with WIELD. And this is a group that, um, let's say a couple of fellow graduates from Santa Barbara, UC Santa Barbara, this is where I graduated from uh, with my PhD. So uh, we have a group of uh, those uh, folks, uh, very good friends of mine, who have formed uh, our own organization called the Western Institute for Endangered Language Documentation, or WIELD. And, and uh, there's the website. I can put it into the chat uh, if oh, you want great. me to. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and uh, so not only are because we have, uh, there are so many groups out there dedicated to endangered languages, but what we are focused on are, are things called fragmented languages. So these are languages where uh, the written record or written documentation are sort of like at a piecemeal level, if even that. So there might be, let's say a word list or uh, maybe a small lexicon, but that's it. That's all that's attested out there. And um, working with, let's say, extinct, uh, well, extinct languages that have not been documented that much, we can only do so much. We can only yes. hypothesize uh, so much about these things. Uh, but um, this is what we try to sort of piece together. And um, that is how we are trying to make our uh, sort of stance visible in the linguistics world. So on fragment, fragmented uh, languages. Uh, so lately we've uh, sort of engaged uh, with the Twitter public uh, with a, a workshop, a Twitter workshop on fragmented languages. So I've, yeah, so I've submitted a couple of items uh, on old Javanese. So I've, uh, much of my latest research has been on old Javanese which I would say in terms of the uh, sort of sphere of fragmented languages, um, it's one of the more highly documented yeah. languages uh, out there. Okay. So there, there's, there, there's, there's just lots of material out there, but a lot of it is uh, like literary. Mm -hmm. So um, there's not so much prose out there uh, in, right. in terms of old Javanese. So um, when people asked like, well, how did people actually use the language? How, you know, what did they uh, speak? That 
I'm not exactly sure how to answer that. Uh, what we do know is that old Javanese, of course, uh, I, I would say old Javanese is one of these transitional languages. So modern Javanese is much more Malayic in character. Right. It's much more Malay influenced than old Javanese was. Yes. Old Javanese is uh, highly reminiscent of a lot of uh, Philippine type languages. Mm. So it's a lot more Philippine type than modern Javanese is yes. now. Uh, yes. And um, uh, there are a whole lot of uh, reasons for this and a whole lot of uh, like factors that go into this. Uh, so I've been taking a look at uh, the use of, uh, uh, let's say, particular discourse particles in old Javanese mm -hmm. texts, uh, as well as um, like the uh, present uses of old Javanese text, uh, especially in the, per, uh, in the uh, performance uh, sphere. Yeah, great. Thank you so much, Edmundo. Thank you. How do you say thank you in Balinese? I, I keep forgetting. Matur suksumo. Matur suksumo. Okay. Matur suksumo. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so I'll add all, all the the details in the in the description below the you know, on the YouTube channel. So yeah, so anybody who wants to who is interested to find out more, just feel free to uh, visit the website. And uh, Edmundo, do you have anything, any Twitter or account or website that you'd like to share as well? Feel free to do it. Oh. <laughs> Well, uh, let me just uh, share my screen again. Oh, yeah, yeah, please do. Yeah. So this is oh. the Western uh, Institute for Endangered Language Documentation. So if anybody's interested, so the um, website there is wheeldoc.org. And um, we do have, uh, let's say, if you're wondering about uh, the fragment, fragmented uh, languages scale, uh, they can read up on that over there. And um, yeah, I would say I, I do have Twitter, uh, but um, there is, let's see, let me put this into uh, the, so they can look me up. I'm, I'm wondering if I should do my, uh, I, I'll do my more professional one. Uh, just because I think that's <laughs> going to be better. That that's uh, going to be uh, a lot more sort of instructive as to Sorry. my academic no uh, sort of presence. No um, yeah, so uh, I'll just pull it up here uh, right away, just because it's not like the easiest thing to remember. I never really remember these things. Um, oh, oh dear. Oh no! Oh, um, I I'll send it to you later. Yeah, it's fine. No uh, worries. Get the chance. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, um, in terms of other things that I can sort of send around, I think like wheel dot uh, wheel doc dot org that would be sort of like the best thing for people to get acquainted, uh, not only with me but uh, with um, uh, our organization. So. Awesome. All right. Thank you. I'll share that in the description. That's great. Okay. So thank you so much. Uh, anything else you'd like to add before we end for a couple more minutes, I think, before Zoom kicks us out? <laughs> I, I, think that, I think that's about it. Okay. Cool. Thank you.